Oh, I was going to say, is she? Oh, she made okay. it. Yeah, she did. Okay. Well, we had contingency and contingency plans in case. between January and February as far as benefits, mm -hmm. but you also see an increase in individuals eligible. So just to remind you that income affects the grant amount. So even though you might have less people or more people on the uh, qualified for the benefit, you could have people working, and so their income would determine the actual benefit amount. So I just wanted to bring your attention to that on page one. Well, that's a good thing, right? I mean. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, page two, there's repeated data, and I just caught it um, last night. So under the intake appointment section, mm -hmm. those, those are where we would see people face-to-face -face in the public, as, uh, public assistance division. Those should both be zero. Those numbers are represented under the customer service center section. Oh, uh, so in February, seven. February, they're zero? Yes. For the walk-ins, or...? Under the intake appointment walk-in, yeah. those should not be zero. Yeah. Um, all of those appointments have been conducted over the phone. Mm -hmm. But the client seen in the lobby, the next section, 70 in January 258, the, that data is accurate. Okay. okay. Um, so again, if you look at February's data, that's about 60 individuals per week that they're receiving in the public assistance division lobby on the second floor. Okay. And then page three. Um, Kelly, Joe, before we go to page three, can you comment regarding the benefit recovery, the total amount calculated? Because there's a huge difference between January and February. Is there a reason? Right. It, it would just be, so the caseworkers that process benefits are the ones that send the referrals in when they identify overpayment. So it would fluctuate month to month okay. on being referred. Um, so yeah, that would, that would be different. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, page three, um, unemployment went up from January to February from 4.9 to 5.5, and March re reported out at 4.8. So you do see fluctuation in, in employment, um, but you probably have already seen reports on that. I just wanted to note March's data. And then um, page four, um, the work experience program section, I just wanted to draw your attention to two parent participation rates. So when it says two parent, those are intact families in Portage County that receive um, benefits, cash assistance benefits. And right now we have about four families. So typically in a pre-COVID world, if they receive cash benefits and they're able-bodied, they would work at a, a work site or do some type of a training for receipt of their benefits. But because of COVID, we've had many work sites that have not been willing to take people in person. So that's why our participation rate is still at zero. Mandy reports that we have more employers or participation sites that have stepped up and said, you know, now we're ready to start receiving people again. So our hope is that we get those individuals connected to a, a worker training component in the near future. Okay. Question, questions on that? Nope. Okay, and then I'm just moving forward. Um, children services, where I see some changes. Um, in the children services world, as of um, the end of February, we had 212 kiddos in custody. We've been averaging around 200, so that's um, promising that kids are either reuniting with family or we, you know, we had an adoption. We had a couple adoptions that I signed off on that are going to be coming to fruition soon. So, um, our, yeah, our numbers are stable at about 200. 
And then the next section is um, child support. And there too, I just wanted to draw your attention to the second row that says total client seen and customer service. Those would be walk-ins. And so we're seeing about 25 um, individuals in the child support area lobby per week. Um, so that's in the riddle box. So again, numbers are really minimal as far as people coming into lobbies of, you know, through February at this point. Are, are you and seeing that now through March and April then? Or are yeah. you seeing more it, people? No, it's been, it hasn't yeah. picked up much at all. Yeah. Okay. Um, on the last section in the child support, you'll see about a $200,000 increase in child support payments being dispersed, which is a good thing. We're also at a tax time where um, some child support debt has been intercepted from tax returns, so that's kind of the correlation between the increase from um, January to February. So those were the high notes that are the things that I thought you might have questions on at the data report. I don't know if you have any additional. No. Nope. I'm gonna just jump, I know you guys are busy, and so I'm gonna just jump into my memo. Um, Sue, I'm gonna let you explain the first one. It is an amendment on a past contract um, per the recommendation of our NOPCOG director. So Sue, can you elaborate on that? Absolutely, this is the uh, Family Community Services contract that we had um, modified the dollars back in, I think February, maybe mm -hmm. January or February, and Craig wanted to make the final contract the amounts agree to what was actually paid, so the TANF amount and the WIOA amount. So that's the only reason he wanted this to go through. So we've already paid everything, we're just cleaning up the numbers pretty okay. much. And if you support that, then Joanne would present that to you on the back, and we just like to give you some heads oh, up okay. of what's. Yeah. Um, yep. And then the second one is um, we would like to engage in a renewed lease with um, Pine Lane Properties, Skip Gray. He did offer us a five, seven, or 10 year lease. Um, I would like to move forward with a renewed five year lease. Averages about $5,000 a month in rent for that building. A total amount for the five year contract at $304,620. So I, I always have the um, vision or hope that one day we can, JFS can all be in one building. So I think we could have seen a little bit of cost savings if we went seven or 10 years, but I just thought it was not, it, it was better to just stick with where we're at. Okay. Okay. Is that okay? Yep. Yes. Okay. So you will get that, like I said, through Joanne. And then as far as some events, high level stuff, um, last year we had our first annual back to school event at the OMJ building and parking lot and we had many, many community partners. We had information sessions about youth and vaping and depression and suicide with young people and health and wellness things and it was a complete success. Well with COVID we're not able to do that kind of in person stuff but wanted to do a drive through. So on uh, July 28th, between four and seven, Ravenna High School has offered their parking lot to us where we'll have about 25 community partners still there on site with information and, and some kits and some freebies and those things. It's just to get necessary information into the hands of families that have kids. So we're looking forward to that. It's not the same as in person, but at least we know we're connecting information and services to families. Okay. And the managed care plans um, are actually going to fund a lot of things there, so it doesn't look like we're going to have any out-of-pocket costs for that Medicaid managed care plan. Great. And yep, the back-to-school um, voucher is what we provide. We've been doing that for five or six years. We use TANF dollars for that. We offer individuals under the 200% poverty guidelines, too, or is it 133? Foods, well, whatever food stamps and cash. I think it's 138%. Yeah, yeah I think that's what food So any families that we are in the community that, that are under the 138% um, poverty guideline that would qualify for food assistance and cash can apply for a $75 voucher. 
and that voucher would be honored at Gabe's in Kent and Burlington Coat Factory. Um, and so it just gives families an opportunity to get an outfit or two or a pair of shoes for the kiddos when they're going back to school. Many, many counties use TANF dollars for back to school events and vouchers like this just to help those struggling in poverty. So we're gonna do that again this year. Um, again, it's June 7th through July 2nd as far as acceptance of applications and Kim will be posting that. I think you have all these flyers to sign off on too that came up your way this week. I think they already did. I think I got them back. Okay. And then the senior forum, this would be our sixth annual in-person forum and our senior citizens in Portage County love this event. Again, sad that we can't do it in person. Had we done it in person, um, we have usually have a hall or a school that donates their space and many many community partners information sessions we've had speakers in the past on alzheimer's and resource assessments when when families are needing to explore nursing homes for families um, medicaid so we use it always as an education base and we get hand, uh, information into the hands of seniors and their families so while we can't do it in person this year we're going to do a drive-through as well Kim reports that she has about commitments from 25 community partners in that space too. But those providers were gonna be more aligned to providing services to senior citizens like Area Agency on Aging and the Medicaid Managed Cares and PARDA, United Way, Alzheimer's Association, those types of organizations. So um, really minimal, I don't think there's any cost in that event either. But again, getting information into the hands of seniors that we haven't been able to see otherwise because mm -hmm. of the pandemic. And then Mandy and her team are so very excited about a May 7th virtual job and career fair, um, <laughs> 9 and 12 p.m. This, um, it, well, I don't even know what you call it. It's a package, it's premier package was purchased by Area 19 um, for the youth of Geauga, Portage, and Ashtabula counties. And we've really maximized this online platform um, again, Mandy reports there's 16 employers committed to doing this virtual job fair, manufacturing, healthcare, the service industry, social service. So what's really neat about this is people enter virtually, but then each agency has their own table and you can communicate live with the employer. They're asking people that register to also download their resume. So, um, Commissioner Tony, we talked about the last one in data, so we're really sure to, we've really been certain to ask these employers to collect necessary data for us. We're going to do a 30-day touch point after the event, just really, you know, looking at who's connecting to genuine employment after these events. So, um, I'll be excited to report that out to you after the event. Then. Thank you. You're welcome. So those were, oh, last but not least, we have nine kiddos in our custody that are gonna be graduating, that are in our foster care custody that are emancipating and graduating from high school this June. So um, we're gonna have an outdoor graduation party for them for safety at Edinburgh Township Park on June 4th between five to seven. So we typically gift our kiddos with a laptop and a gift card from a local, like a Target. Um, we have cake and ice cream, traditional graduation. And we just celebrate their success and, um, you know, wish them best as they transition into adulthood. So you're always welcome to join that event if you have the time. Um, but we're really pleased and excited to have nine kids graduating this June. And where is that being held? Edinburgh. Oh, Edinburgh the last page Yeah, the Edinburgh Park. Okay. You asked Thank me you. how to get there, I wouldn't be able to tell you. <laughs> oh, oh, I can get there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so that was it for outreach events. Unless you had any questions in that space. Nope. No. Okay. It's doing a great job. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. So moving on, um, I have invited Representative Gail, I'm probably going to pronounce it wrong, but Lita, yeah. Um, yeah, to come to JFS. Um, she accepted my invitation. She'll be here on May 10th. Uh, we're on the 1030 hour, but I'm going to shore up logistics. Um, Joel Potts, who is our Ohio Department of Job and Family Services Association president for all 88 counties, is going to come down from Columbus and join us. You are all, you all are welcome as well. Um, I'll get details to you if your time allows. But 
I think it's, we've hosted a number of um, senators and representatives here. It's really important for them to see all the great stuff we do at Portage. It also gives me an opportunity to talk about some of the challenges we have. I know right now they're shoring up the state budget. We do not know what type of impact it's going to have on us, so we're kind of waiting with bated breath. But um, like in the past when and Senator Eklund was there, he was a, a huge supporter of us getting that mm -hmm. one time short this fund. So again, it's really good for them to see boots on the ground, what we're doing. We have offered representatives and senators to do drive alongs with our social workers in the past. So. Whatever she's interested in seeing and doing, we're gonna open up our world to her. So I just wanted to let you know she'll be here on May 10th. Do you know what time she's coming? Has she set up a time, Kelly? It, we, we talked about 10.30, but could I get back to you and confirm the time? Yeah, would you, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. I'll send to all of you the yeah, confirmation. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, I think on my agenda, the next thing is a request for your support and moving our child support office to the administration building. Am I am I on target there? Yes. Yes. The next one. Okay. So we have about twenty, we have a couple resignations today. So we're about a little over twenty some child support staff that occupies two floors in the riddle block. Um, Lisa Fay, who's the administrator there, and Rebecca Abbott, who's the administrator for public assistance on the second floor have got together and really looked at space options and we believe we can accommodate that team at the second floor and the second floor okay. share the lobby um, also that would reduce some of our costs associated with rent of about mm -hmm. eighty thousand dollars a year so um, if you support that we would like to move forward in that space and have that transition occur by July 1st of this year mm -hmm. sure yeah I will just make sure that we let Dave later know to see how you know that yeah. impacts our budget but I I'm sure it's fine Kelly Joe okay perfect I'll I'll do that I'll follow up I was gonna follow up with him on a number of other yeah issues. you might want to say something to him because we're you know getting ready to do budget stuff and that's that'll have an impact on ours so but no we, we I think it's more convenient for you to have your operations all here so yes. And I just wanted to circle back on the rent topic. I'm not at this point asking again for a reduction in square footage or any of that, but I am asking as we wait to see what happens with the state budget, with the levy, and then I'm going to talk to you about the certainty grant in a minute, that we could hold off on completing all of our payments for this building in 2020 until we can see, and then I can establish a payment plan with um, Mr. Lair in the next month or so, would that be feasible with all of you instead of asking for reduction and in, in space and all of that? Why don't you get with Dave, Kelly Joe, and then we'll have him report back to us because I hate to say yes and Not we don't have a full overview picture. So, because I know okay. you still owe rent from what last year, right? 2020? Not for the rental block, but four months of rent for the admin building. Yes. Yeah. And that's yeah. What I was that's what I thought. Yeah. Because that does impact our bottom line, so we just have to make sure. Can I, okay. can I go ahead and talk to him about that? Right. Yes. Talk with him before we make any decisions okay. on that. Okay? Oh, thank you. And then moving on to the next topic is a certainty grant update. And so, um, Protect Ohio, we, you all know I beat that topic down and that's primarily the reason we came before the taxpayers um, and the voters for this new levy. So there was always a plan and it was approved by um, the federal government to have one time or one pod of restoration funds for the 12 counties that were negatively impacted by the loss of Protect Ohio. And I've updated you three or four or five times over the last two years about that because last year we thought we were going to get that gap funding last year and they kicked the can down the road yeah. and then last September they shared with us that it would be January we would, where we would start receiving monthly payments for those restoration funds. Well, here came January and January passed. February came. We outreached to the state. They said they hadn't heard from the federal government. They were waiting. March came and went, they were waiting. April, we outreached to the, the state and we were finally advised, and I don't think they held it from us, I think all those months they were waiting, 
that the federal government, the Department of Health and Human Services had a discrepancy in the data entered from Ohio Department of Job and Family Services and they were unable to finalize the total amount that would be divided between the 12 counties relevant to the restoration funds. So I'm not in the office today, but I do have a letter from the federal government to the state that I can share with you as you know, documentation and verification that this has been significantly delayed. With that being said, we've been without about $400,000 over the last months because based on the formula, we had projected to receive about $98,000 every month you know, to get those restoration funds. It's not long term, it was just a one-time kind of pot of money. Um, if indeed this isn't rectified between the federal government and the state within like the first two weeks of February, I would like to ask for your support in getting a cash advance of $400,000 until those dollars finally hit our allocations because we're we're working without it um kelly joe you said the second week of february she meant may may i meant yeah. may <laughs> i was like when are you next year yeah. <laughs> yeah. i meant may but um she had, they had the state had until april 30th to correct make the corrections in the system and the state has verified that they've done that but again we can't control the finalization part of it from the federal government. So I, again, would like to outreach to David if I could, um, if we don't get anything by the second week of May, it would be something that would be paid back when the funds do get our allocations. It's just, we, we're needing some padding to get us through until those dollars come. Is there a chance that you may not receive them at all? I don't think so. Um, again, I'll share the letter with you all. And the governor, um, not the governor, Ohio Department of Job and Family Services, Kim Hall, wrote it in some type of a statute in December that it was going to happen. So I don't think so, but, you know, we all work in government. We can't 100% guarantee, but we're still optimistic that it's coming. And it's 400000 I mean, they've given you the amount. Is that correct? 98000 was the based on the formula, so 98 times four would be a little shy of $400,000. But that could shift too. But again, it would be something we would pay back once the allocations come. Right. We thought, as you know, they were gonna hit us in January. We would start getting them in January and we did not. I'm happy to share okay. the letter with you. Okay. Yeah, talk with Dave Blair. And yeah, because my only concern is if something happens and then they don't fund it. <laughs> but I mean, you probably need the funding, but yeah. again, that's going to make a shift in our overall budget. So, okay. So I would be good to talk to him if we haven't heard any great news by yes. the yes. Second, and look to be able to present that with an actual like a repayment agreement, right. and not just a gift from you. It right. would be a yeah, yeah. Okay. an advance. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. And then um, that was the certainty grant. I just wanted to say our levy committee, which is outside of job and family, because we're not allowed to, you know, advocate on behalf of our levy, but they've done wonderful things. I don't know if you saw in the portager that the League of Women Voters have yes. voted mm -hmm. to support the levy. United Way just um, voted to support our levy. So next week is a big deal for us. Sure. And um, they just have done a great job of putting that issue out to the public. And so we're, calling it into existence that we're going to pass our levy. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Last few things, secondary trauma training. Um, it's our child welfare workers specifically have, you know, 18 months is the average as far as people being able to sustain themselves in abuse, neglect worlds or realms. And most of our staff have been with us for a long time. But we also have to be very concerned with their mental health and the support that we need to provide to them. And not just our child protective workers, we need to be concerned of the mental health and the supports we give to all JFS employees because we're all dealing with vulnerable populations. And unless we take care of ourselves, it's going to have an impact on retention on the job and you know our you know, connections with our clients and our citizens. So we're looking to bring an in-house training um, here in the summer to do some health and wellness and um, secondary trauma training. So I just wanted you all to know that I'm going to be coordinating that, but it's really important that we give credence to our staff that you know, during the pandemic specifically, our child and adult protective workers were still out in the fields knocking on doors and, you know, right. abuse didn't stop. So um, that's something we're going to continue.
continue to do on an annual basis. I just wanted to update you on that. And then Sue has a resolution for you, and we have two executive sessions. But other than that, do you have any questions on any of my open agenda material? No. 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 Thank you so much. You're on. All right, yep, so I just have one this week. This is our regular um, staff costs uh, that the WEA fund is paying back to public assistance for um, an adjustment for March of 2021 and then for April of 2021. Let's move the Board of Commissioners agrees to transfer $71,429.61 from fund 1413 WIA fund to fund 1410 public assistance fund. Second. Okay, roll call, Tony. Yes. Vicki? Yes. Sabrina? Yes. Okay, first of all, we have public comment, Kelly, in about seven minutes. Is your first executive session going to take more than five minutes or? No. Okay, no. so let's do the first one and then you got to be out at 11. Is there any public comment, Amy? Mm -hmm. You know? No. Not so far. Yeah. And now, have a good day, guys. You too. Thanks, Sue. Let's move in accordance with Ohio Revised Code Section 121.22G1 motion to enter an executive session to consider a compensation for a public employee. Okay. Second. Oh, okay. Roll call. Roll call. Yes. Vicki? Yes. Sabrina? Yes. 